Uh, welcome to Battle of Homestead Foundation's 2022 program series. Uh, I'm John Hare, the president of the board. Uh, tonight, we'll again dig deep in the fertile soil of American social and industrial history. We'll cover a period in which our parents and grandparents lived and worked, and we'll talk about how this history affects us all and our future. Our focus is the tumultuous era of the late 1930s through the 1940s, World War II and beyond, specifically the decades when the U.S. labor movement finally won national legal recognition and significant governmental enforcement of workers' rights and organization. Uh, historian Ron Schatz, a friend of many here tonight because of his Pittsburgh ties. First off, welcome back to Pittsburgh, uh, Ron. Uh, and uh, he's penned a, a book out last year called The Labor Board Crew, Remaking Worker-Employee Relations from Pearl Harbor to the Reagan Era. Uh, Ron will be our guide, discussing a remarkable band of economists and lawyers assembled by FDR at the outbreak of the catastrophic Great War. Uh, and this band uh, shaped labor policy for generations. Joining Professor Schatz will be panelists, labor historian Jack Metzger, and United Steelworkers member, educator, and organizer John Lepley. Uh, retired NLRB board agent and Battle of Homestead Foundation Program Committee Chair uh, Suzanne Donsky will serve as moderator for the event. But first, let me briefly tell you about the Battle of Homestead Foundation. Uh, our founders were inspired by a dramatic labor conflict, the 1892 Battle of Homestead. Uh, the nation's eyes back then were on this thriving industrial town 12 miles downriver from Pittsburgh. The strong union the amalgamated had built powerful alliances within the workforce, the community, and the region. They had to defend their labor contract and its high compensation and work standards. Their employer, the Carnegie Steel Company, a monopoly steel coal empire controlled by Andrew Carnegie and his henchman Henry Clay Frick, was determined to cut wages and break the union. When the contract expired, Frick built an eight foot high wall around the mill, locked out the workers and launched plans to import scab labor. An epic struggle ensued, which despite extraordinary resistance and militants by the workers and their allies ultimately resulted in the defeat of the union. That's because 8,000 state militia were sent in by the governor to occupy the mill and protect scab labor. There are many sub stories and revelations within this epic, far too many to relate tonight. The more we dig deeper and learn, we discover and celebrate the seeds of hope in that resilience workers and community struggle. Our Battle of Homestead mission is to grow those seeds by promoting a people's history but also we work to empower today's workforce and build strategies for a future that benefits all working families in our nation. Our goal is to develop a regional center and institute for labor history and the future of work. Two years ago, about this time, the COVID pandemic forced us to change how we do our mission. Our public panels, historic commemorations, concerts and drama are still now presented online only. Publicity is generated with partners through social media. Today, in the third year of COVID, the threat remains uncertain. Actually, we've discovered new opportunities to reach out, educate, fundraise, and organize. Today, the seeds of hope still sprout anew, even as our country faces major social, economic, and political crisis. But crisis can also mean opportunity. Since November 3rd, 2020, we can begin to see the light. We take heart and recognize the tremendous organizing by grassroots groups throughout the nation, many women-led, often in coalitions with organized labor. This heroic effort was the engine that expanded the electorate, giving voice to millions of average working people. Thus was propelled the election defeat of a mendacious anti-democratic president and his morally bankrupt enablers but the hard-won progress is by no means assured to continue. 
Tonight, we again celebrate creative grassroots workplace organizing and alliance building. We're optimistic about our mission as we see the growth of power for working men and women and, and their communities. So we say, come join us. More about our exciting upcoming programs in the wrap up tonight. Now I'm delighted to give the mic to Suzanne Donsky, our own labor hero. Suzanne. Thank you, John. Welcome to everyone. So glad you could be with us tonight. We know you have a lot of different places you could be or things that you could be doing. And we're really pleased that you choose to spend this time with us. I am going to be the moderator for tonight's program, and I'd like to just give you an idea of what to expect. You're going to be hearing from Dr. Ron Schatz, of course, for an overview of his book, The Labor Board Crew. It's a terrific book. It's been described as a collective biography of the players who made up the War Labor Board and the lasting impact that their important work had on mediation and arbitration in multiple industries across the country. Following Dr. Schatz will be author and retired professor Jack Metzger, whose particular focus will be on how the War Labor Board members influence the steel industry, including here in Pittsburgh. Then we're going to hear from John Lepley, an educator, organizer, and grievance chair with the United Steelworkers. And he'll be talking about the practical impact that these movers and shakers had on the daily lives of working people in the steel mills and elsewhere. We want you to be part of the discussion as well. So we'll be having a question answer session after the guests have spoken. We ask that you please place your questions of the panelists in the chat, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Also, check the chat as we go along, and you'll receive links to our panelists' publications and other important information that might interest you. So without further delay, I'd like to call on longtime Battle of Homestead Foundation member, retired Pitt professor of history, Joe White, who's going to introduce our featured speaker. Joe? Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Suzanne, and thank you, uh, Ron, for being with us tonight. Uh, many of us are reasonably knowledgeable about the ABCs of the National Industrial Relation Act uh, and its uh, state clones. 30% minimum uh, of workers have to sign cards for there to be an election. How important it is uh, the shape of the bargaining unit uh, as it's determined uh, by uh, following the rules and regulations what the uh, boss can and cannot do by way of persuasion and pressure, winning the election, the fact that winning the election does not guarantee a contract and, and bargaining in good faith by, the, uh, by management. What most of us, however, don't know as much about and is the subject of Ron's book is that from December 1941 to 1980, the shape of labor relations in this country were largely determined by Executive Order 9017, issued by President Franklin D. Roosevelt immediately after Pearl Harbor. It established the War Labor Board and its successors. Their remit was nothing less than the sweeping institutionalization of arbitration and mediation in order to operationalize collective bargaining in an era of gigantic corporations, mass unionization, especially in heavy industry, wars, hot, cold, and as the years wore on, seemingly endless, and national emergencies as defined from time to time by a politically minded presidents. What did this fleshing out of a new system of industrial relations accomplish? Was what it accomplished good for workers and their unions? Schatz's answer is unambiguous. First, the, he tells us that the theory and practice of mediation and arbitration resulted in far more labor peace than would otherwise have been the case. 
In his view, neither theory nor experience suggests that working people would have been better off if class struggle had been allowed to rage unabated and unmediated. That insight of Ron's was only the tip of the proverbial tip of the iceberg. As a result of the labor peace dividend, as we may call it, millions of workers were, in his words, far better paid, received unprecedented pension and medical insurance, and had more protection on the job than their counterparts experienced in earlier days, or for that matter, than such workers received nowadays. Although the biggest beneficiaries were white male union members, conditions significantly approved for male workers of color and women who belong to unions. This then is a book that goes straight to the heart of serious thinking about workers in the 20th and 21st centuries. Should their ultimate goal be to seek peaceful ways to level the playing field? Or was and is the wobbly call to fan the flames of discontent still the way to go? So far, we've been talking about Ron's book. But as an article in the current issue of The New Yorker points out, if you want to understand the book, especially a history book, you need to understand the author as well. Ron Schatz was born in Chicago and graduated from the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, this in itself was a promising enough start for a budding labor historian. His graduate education began at the University of Warwick in England under E.P. Thompson, one of the greatest historians of the 20th century. It continued here in Pittsburgh under David Montgomery, one of the founders of the new labor history. David had this awesome ability to bring out the very best in his students. In my opinion, David's uh, skill as a teacher flowed from the way that he encouraged, indeed demanded that his students think for themselves. Paper is being stubborn. Got it. We Battle of Homestead Foundation folks recognize the importance of place if you wish to understand people and their history and culture. In his teaching and writing at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, Ron did the same thing. He and his students studied the labor history of Middletown, Connecticut. In a gem of an article published in the prestigious journal Past and Present, he dissects the decline and fall of the Middletown industrial barons of the 1930s. After an absence of more than 40 years, Ron is now back in Pittsburgh. Let us give him a hearty, if zoomified, welcome. Thank you, Joe. Ron, take it away. Okay, great. C can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Thank you. Okay, great, great. I, I, was, I want like to thank John and, and, and Suzanne and, and Joe for, for your, your kind introduction and, and, and inviting me to speak here. Um, I'll be brief. Um, my book tells the story of a group of young economists and, and lawyers who were recruited and trained by this new agency, the, the Na National World Labor Board in 1942. They resolved thousands of, of, of uh, union management conflicts in order to maintain peace essential for defeating the Axis powers. Um, uh, the book highlights uh, the, the, the board employed about 250 uh, uh, staffers, but my book highlights the most important ones, small group, which were particularly important amongst them. Um, all of whom, but six were, were male. More about that later. Um, the book, these young men bonded together like Marines at war. And although the board closed its doors in December 1945, the group continued to work together under other auspices, resolving conflicts in the United States and overseas for the rest of their lives. After the war ended, they mediated and arbitrated disputes between unions and management in steel, 
construction, the public schools, city uh, sanitation departments, professional sports, and many other industries. When unions threatened uh, uh, to call strikes, uh, called strikes to threaten the entire economy, or inflation rose rapidly, one president of the United States after another, as, as well as a number of governors, repeatedly appointed the v veterans of the War Labor Board. I, I call them the veterans, just because oh. like the soldiers, they were veterans this, uh, this other experience, uh, as their principal representatives. The group conducted mm -hmm. research on industrialization around the world in the 1950s and 60s, uh, from, from Latin America to, to, to East Asia. And in the process, they became convinced that the capitalist system and the communist systems would con converge over time. Uh, besides this, after the war, they uh, were hired as professors of industrializations and in new programs in, from Berkeley to, 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 uh, uh, to, 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 to uh, uh, Harvard and everywhere in between to every major university outside the non-union South, um, uh, 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 where they, they were essentially these new industrial relations programs with the predecessors of what other programs you're more familiar with, the Black Studies programs of the 1960s, or Women's Studies programs of the 50s, of the 60s, or the environmental, ethnic, and queer studies programs at, at universities today. During the uh, student re revolt of the 1960s, the trustees at universities appointed these industrial relations pro professors as their presidents, provosts, and top deans. Who else was better qualified at, to handle students than mediators who'd worked with factory workers and management, the trustees reasoned. In the 1970s, they worked with President uh, Richard Nixon and President Ford to try to stop the cont contained strikes and, 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 and control and, and curtail slow inflation. They continued this work all the way into the 1970s. Uh, 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 Professor uh, John Dunlop of Harvard, who was one of the most eminent of these groups, uh, for, for example, directed the Dunlop Commission on the Future of Work and Employment Relations for the Clinton administration. The labor board vets taught hundreds of graduate students, but only one of their students was as brilliant, impassioned, and tough skinned as his mentor. That was a, an MIT industrial relations student named George Schultz. As Secretary of Labor in the Nixon administration, Schultz drew on the mediation techniques that he'd learned from his mentors to desegregate public schools in Southern states. Had been done before till 65, 69, 70. This under, during the Nixon administration and under Schultz, they introduced affirmative action in the construction industry, in the steel industry, and then all American industries. Then he comes back as Secretary of State in the Reagan administration and working with Soviet leaders and, and, and Reagan to negotiate the first treaty which reduced nuclear weapons and made the crucial steps to end, at least at that time, the Cold War. Schultz continued to pursue, pursue his work even after leaving government. In 2000, 2018, at the age of 97, Schultz flew back from California to DC to speak to the Senate Armed Service Committee 
about in, the warning against inter, inter, introducing small, quote unquote, nuclear weapons in the US arsenal. Philip Murray of Pittsburgh, the president of the Steelworkers and the CIO, called these young economists and lawyers the labor board boys. These intermediaries were so young and yet had so much power. The phrase struck me as just right for the title for the book. However, the director of the press didn't like the gendered title. Hence, we have the name labor board crew, but the, te the text itself, it's the boards. I will conclude by mentioning three Pittsburgh people who are particularly important in this story. One was John Ben Fisher, a young socialist who became the steelworkers top negotiator in the steel industry for arbitration cases. And quoting Fisher, over a period of time, arbitration became the instrument for writing the nitty gritty of contracts. Second was a young economist who went to work for, 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 for the labor board board's uh, branch in Philadelphia named Marvin Miller. After the war, after the war, he went, he became a, 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 a economist and then the chief economist for the steelworkers. But he never abandoned his original radical dreams. Consequently, Miller was delighted when he was given the opportunity to direct the, a new organization, the Major League Baseball Players Association in 1965. What could be more alluring, alluring than the opportunity to radicalize, to re revolutionize the national pastime? And finally, and perhaps most importantly, was Sylvester Garrett, who among other positions was the top arbitrator for the steelworkers and US Steel Company for more than 30 years. There are relatively few big steel mills in the United States, but it was utterly different back then and Garrett was at the epicenter of those conflicts. Thank you. So turn, who should we turn to? Um, we, should, we should return to Suzanne. Uh, and if Suzanne's not available, um, we should go directly, I think, to John Lepley. Thank you, John. And, and Ron, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to my basement where uh, so much I've done so much work on Zoom over the past two years since the start of this pandemic. Um, as I was reading Ron's book, I, I couldn't help but think of my my own academic background and my entry into the labor movement. I've been in the education department of the United Steelworkers since 2010, and uh, I actually had a brief foray with the National Labor Relations Board. Um, in 2004 and five, when I was going through the industrial and labor relations program at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, and we have two uh, uh, retired professors from that department on here. I see Charles McCollister and Donald McPherson on this call. Uh, throughout that program, uh, we were discussing uh, the labor movement past and present. At that time, union density in the country in the United States was, I'm guessing, 13, 12 percent, somewhere around there. And of my 20 or so classmates, we, we became a pretty tight cohort over that uh, year and a half, two year period. Uh, I would say the majority of my classmates were uh, not so much interested in labor side work, uh, working with unions or working as personnel 
directors in uh, unionized workplaces, but more towards human resource uh, management, uh, personnel development. And so as I was reading Ron's book, particularly the first couple chapters, uh, it, it's almost like an action movie where uh, George Taylor uh, and uh, Paul, I'm, I'm blanking on the other name right now, are assembling this cohort of young lawyers, economists, and problem solvers. Uh, and so I, I think some things we need to think about that made the, the material conditions that made that possible were first, uh, the labor movement uh, had exploded by this period in 1941 with the, the birth of the CIO uh, from the doldrums of the 1920s. Uh, and in fact, from 1919 to 1929, uh, those were, I, I think those were years of disaster for the labor movement. Uh, there's a, a great book by... Uh, Oh, help me out, Ron, uh, by Bernstein, uh, that describes the, the collapse in union density in that period. Uh, secondly, so we have the growth of the labor movement, which was made possible by favorable government policy. And as was mentioned at the beginning with the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, so we have government policy. And I think the second thing was uh, there was the, the academic background made available for this. Uh, so I see this convergence of factors that led to this. So um, I look at myself in 2005, where the majority of my classmates uh, opted for another life. I'm not, I'm not criticizing their decisions, but they, for the most of them uh, who remain in the field, they are working as human resource professionals in largely non-union environments. And so I, I think the question that, that came to mind is, would the labor board crew or boys be possible today? And in terms of academic infrastructure, uh, many of those industrial relations programs that Ronald mentioned, uh, either they don't exist anymore or they have slowly transformed in the last 35, 40 years. Uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, where I uh, earned my master's degree, changed in the past few years from industrial and labor relations to employment and labor relations. Uh, they still cover collective bargaining and uh, I think the problem solving that I learned, but I think the drift of the, the graduates is more towards HR and, and uh, not working with unions. And then looking at the bigger tier one universities, Cornell, University of Illinois, uh, they too, I think are in that trend and the Industrial Relations Research Association which was housed at the University of Wisconsin, I believe that changed to Labor Employment Relations Association. Uh, and that too, the, the drift is towards uh, human resource development, personnel management, non-union workplaces. Um, Thank so. you. Thank you, John. This is Susanna, I'm back. That was really exciting. The power went out at my house and I'm, I apologize for that unanticipated absence. Um, but John, thank you so much for introducing yourself, it appears. <laughs> and I, I appreciate your comments. It's, it's my pleasure now to introduce you to author and retired professor Jack Metzger, um, he served as a professor of humanities from Roosevelt University in Chicago. He's a core member of the Chicago Center for Working Class Studies. His research interests include labor politics, working class voting patterns, working class culture, and popular and political discourse about class. He is a former president of the Working Class Studies Association. And Mr. Metzger has published two critical works that you definitely want to check out. The first is called Striking Steel, a book in which Mr. Metzger deftly combines personal memoir and historical narrative as he examines unionism in American life during the second half of the 20th century by drawing on his own father's experiences. And in his most recent book called Bridging the Divide, Mr. Metzger seeks to determine the differences between working class and middle class cultures in the United States. No small task. Now, writing as a middle class professional, 
with a working class upbringing. He explains the various ways that the two cultures conflict and complement each other, illustrated by his own lived experiences. So Mr. Metzger, I know you've had the pleasure of reading and reviewing Dr. Schatz's labor board crew, and I know you have a particular interest in Sylvester Garrett, one of the labor crew members that Dr. Schatz referenced, and as did John. And we'd like if you could tell us a little bit what you think about Sylvester Garrett's work as an arbitrator for the steel industry during the union's glory years, how that work impacted and even improved your own life and the lives of others. Mr. Metzger. Okay, everybody can hear me? Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first, thanks uh, for this invitation. It's great to be, I'm um, in Chicago, uh, but it's great to be back in Pittsburgh in the Western Pennsylvania uh, via Zoom. Um, and before I focus in on my narrow interest, uh, I just wanna say how much I enjoyed the book, um, both the style of it, these mini biographies uh, attached to a string of historical disputes, labor disputes mostly, but some other ones uh, that the mediators and arbitrators that uh, Ron focuses on, uh, how enjoyable that was to read, uh, but also the, the substance of it. I never paid attention to these people. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, like, uh, uh, I said in the review, it's like studying the referees in the football game, except these guys had a lot more power. Um, um, so I'm glad Ron covered the broad scope of the book. I'm going to get very narrow and talk about one person and one decision that person made. And I want to focus on the Steel chapter and Sylvester Garrett, uh, for whom I had a great affection before I read the book. I had never read anything about Sylvester Garrett. Um, I just knew his name and one decision that he made. Uh, a decision I think was momentous and that greatly affected my father who was a steel worker, my uncles who were all steel workers, about a third of my neighborhood were steel workers. Uh, and this one decision was a, a breathtaking one and I'm gonna try to explain that. But besides affecting the steelworkers, I came to realize, hey, this really had an economic impact too that I had missed when I was writing uh, Striking Steel. Uh, the key decision that Garrett made involved what's called the pass practice clause in section 2B of what was the basic steel contract. And that clause says that management can change any working condition it wants if the basis for existence, and that's the key phrase, the basis for existence uh, of the working condition has been changed or eliminated. So, you know, even before anybody asked that there's gonna be interpretation of what the basis uh, for existence means. So that, that wasn't put in the basic steel contract in 1947. In 1949, um, an industrial engineer at National Tube, which I think is a McKeesport, right? Uh, yeah, uh, figured out a way that the work of seven guys at the blast furnace could be done by five. And so the company was gonna eliminate two jobs at the blast furnace um, and the union grieved it took four years for that to work its way through the, the grievance procedure. But finally in 1953, it got to Garrett. And Garrett decided that the industrial engineer was just finding a better way to do the work. He was nothing in the underlying, the, the basis for existence of the working condition had changed. Uh, so company could not eliminate those two jobs. Now that may seem like a little technical thing, 
But that, when you, when you look at the history of the steel industry, you look at the history of factories in general, the whole reason for industrial engineers was to find better ways to do things in order to eliminate jobs. And not necessarily always by actually industrial engineers, not usually by simple brutal speed up, but by really finding improvements, which most workers themselves developed those improvements uh, over time in the history of factory, factory work. So this is a huge, huge uh, decision. It was a huge victory for job security. Those two guys that got to spend the rest of their life in, in the mill, which most of us who live middle, comfortable middle-class lives may think that's not great, but in the 1950s, uh, it was the best job uh, around, or at least for a working class person. Uh, <clears throat> but it also meant, and anyway, it was a big victory for shop floor power, which the steelworkers built on, on uh, over the next 20, 30, uh, 30 years. But it also meant that there was nothing left for the industrial engineer to do except set, set incentive rates. And my argument is, I think the, the, the record is, oh, there's no systematic study. I think the anecdotal evidence is overwhelming that steel workers by the 1950s enjoyed a substantial advantage in the, the incentive rating process. They systematically were able, most workers most of the time were able to systematically set rates at, uh, at levels that were comfortable for them to meet. And in some cases, they set outrageous rates. Uh, when the mills were going down, one of the concessions, the local concessions that the mills asked for was to eliminate these 200% uh, incentives, 300%. At the mill that my father worked, there were, I, I don't know, maybe 80, 100, 400%. <laughs> that means if you work for one hour, uh, you're, you're in, you're, the job is for one hour and you uh, do it in 15 minutes, instead of getting... $20 for that hour, you get, uh, you get 60. Um, so it was, an, it was an enormous benefit in terms of financially for steel workers and for their families like, like mine, where, where I grew up, steel worker, steel worker families, steel worker kids like me, we had weekly allowances. We, we came to high school, we had money in our pocket, not a lot, but some. And a lot of us had a chance to go to college, completely changed uh, the, the, the immediate life conditions, but also the long-term prospects of those of us who uh, uh, were fortunate enough to be part of steelworker families during that time. Um, so Garrett made other decisions and I had one other, maybe <laughs> I could talk about if I, I have more time, um, in the 50s that strengthened both shop four power and the union's bargaining position in general. And Ron, you showed that he was not a typical of professional uh, labor mediators, arbitrators of his time. Um, and so I, I wonder why did the companies keep agreeing? So this is a question to Ron. Why did the companies keep agreeing to hire Sylvester Garrett and they don't like him? Um, didn't they, I mean, they complained about this past practice clause and went after it time after time. 52 was partly about it, 59 was all about it. Uh, the strikes in 52 and 59. Um, and yet they keep hiring, they kept hiring <laughs> Garrett to make these decisions. And again, I think that's typical of the war years and the immediate post-war years when the unions and managements were working out the system. Uh, the, uh, the labor board crew seems pretty pro-union to me, uh, at least from today's perspective. So that's my question. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. Ron, you want to answer the question? Well, uh, yes, but very, very briefly, because I, I, there's many fine, insightful uh, people in this audience who ought to have much to contribute to. But very quick, quickly, um, the union was strong. It was very militant. You know, this wasn't incidentally in the 30s. It was built up over time during the war and after the war. 
through a succession of, of battles and winning the battles or, 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 or winning enough that they could such that then the, 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 that the steel companies had to deal with them. And the, and, and the, uh, me, and the arbitrators were smart, knew enough to give as much as they could to both sides to satisfy each side enough that they would uh, uh, continue to employ them. You know, they're working for the steel companies and they're working for the unions. They'd be fired in a moment and sometimes were. And they, in fact, they fired a whole bunch of them before they finally hired Garrett and Garrett was the <laughs> best one they had. And so they kept them and kept them and kept them. And, and uh, uh, e even after the 1959 steel strike, the biggest strike in American history. And, and then worked with both sides to try to bring them back together to cooperate, which they succeeded in doing with the 1950, uh, 1972 uh, no-strike pledge. Um, about uh, um, John's point, uh, the, the, uh, if I understood correctly, the times were different. You know, the United States was confronting the Soviet Union. There, there was reasons for both sides on inside the United States to cooperate. You know, we don't have that situation now. To be sure, we're confronting the so the Russia again, but the unions are, are in, in 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 those industries are not important. That's not to say the unions are unimportant. In some industries, particularly the in public employees unions, they're very strong. To not to mention, for instance, the uh, uh, professional sports. I mean, is there any sports, <laughs> any unions ever stronger in the United States than the professional sports? But, and, and, and in some of the, these labor board boys who became the arbitrators for all of them. But I want to stop now and let other people speak. I'd like to uh, turn back to John Lepley for a minute. And I do want to tell you a little bit about him. I'm sorry that was... Uh, not possible with my power outage, but um, John comes from a background where he was actually raised, um, I should say, I'm not sure where he was born, but he, he, he grew up on a, um, base, a military base. I'm sorry, I'm having computer problems again, just in case, please, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. So uh, just a quick background. I, I was born on mine on Air Force Base, but I, uh, I grew up actually near where uh, Jack Metzger did uh, about a half hour away. My dad was actually a steel worker at Bethlehem for six months. And then, uh, uh, well, how do I say this? He uh, he won a draft lottery uh, and uh, he spent the next 24 years in the Air Force and uh, it really tracked with sort of the deindustrialization of Johnstown. Right. That the uh, I think as a lot of people from working class communities have seen that the military became a reliable source of employment for people uh, who, who, who previously may have lived in these blue collar communities. Uh, I, I think the, the second question I, I, I had in mind was uh, um, how, how the labor board approach differed from uh, previous policy handling labor disputes. Uh, oh. and, and actually, I'll, I'll uh, sort of introduce my introduction to labor history, which was my sophomore year in high school, as I'm sure for many people, uh, it was US history 1865 to then dating myself the late 1990s. Uh, so of course, after the Civil War, what did I learn but the Battle of Homestead, the 1877 railroad strike, uh, what seemed to me like we went from a civil war to class war from the 1860s right up until the 1930s. And I know this is painting with a very big brush, but I, I think there's a good uh, one good narrative is that workers would organize regardless of industry and employers, uh, often with the assistance of the state whether local, state, or federal governments would, in many cases, violently crush them. Not all the time, but that is a pattern you see, particularly in Western Pennsylvania 
or some of the most egregious cases in Ludlow, Colorado, Coeur d'Alene. Uh, it, it's the Battle of Homestead, uh, why we were all here. And the, the chapter that, that Ron, or the, this episode that Ron talks about was such a striking departure from that policy uh, where the hammer was always used here. We were using arbitrators to, to problem solve. Uh, yes. the, the only, uh, uh, I, I don't have a PhD in labor history, just, uh, but what comes to mind, the only precedent that I can think of is the instance of the 1902 anthracite strike mm -hmm. where President Roosevelt mediated a strike. And this is notable because he simply did not call in uh, a militia to crush coal miners in eastern right. Pennsylvania who were organizing. He, he did what President well, his cousin did in 30 some years later, he pulled together a commission. Uh, and I, I can't remember the particulars of that deal, but the coal miners didn't get everything they wanted. They got a generous raise, but they didn't get union recognition from the employers either. John's, John's right, exactly right. Um, but this is the beginning of, of a system of first of mediation and then of arbitration. And the, the, the latter especially becomes important during the First World War, mm -hmm. when, when, uh, when, when contract rec recognition was mandatory for companies that, 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 that uh, had federal contracts. Now that ended right after the war, mm -hmm. but there's a precedent here, which is then replicated uh, during the Second World War, and in that case, continued afterwards. Yeah. That first, second, um, something about these labor board uh, uh, vets, or better uh, labor board bo boys, or I've delight, been delighted to talk about this. Several women who were involved in this too, but but it was overwhelmingly male. Um, the the uh, if we go back to the to the early twentieth century. The arbitrators acted as judges. They would sit uh, on, on a higher bench and listen to both sides and then make an order. George Taylor, who was the mentor for all these <laughs> labor board people, uh, he, and he was doing this in, in the garment industry in Philadelphia, <laughs> had a different approach he would meet, sit at the same table with these people and, 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 not, and draw out from each of them, trying to figure out what they would want that would be compatible between the two, two of them and reach slowly. He was a Quaker. Many of these people were Quakers. There are others from other religious faiths that have similar sort of social reform kind of mentalities. And, uh, more than that, when they after they when they meet, then the, the, he's meeting with both sides, and then he's, he he drafts a a, 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 a a decision, but he doesn't hand it out. Instead, he gives a draft of it to both sides. Does this seem okay to you? If not, what is it? Do it both sides, and then if need be, revise it again, even a third time. What he's doing there is bringing together both sides to satisfy each other. Who's left out? Well, the workers. They're not involved at all. It's the representatives of the union, of the workers in the union, and, and the management who, is, who, who, who are making these decisions. And that's why you would have the situation that, that Jack describes, where at a, a, a McKeesport, where it takes four years for a, a resolution. But through this complex system, highly bureaucratic, if you will, but it, you know, pro progressives at the time and later denounced that decision, that system, but it sure proved beneficial to many, not all, many working class people. That was actually going to be one of my questions for John Lepley is, is what your perspective is, what your view is on how the War Labor Board veterans after the war 
um, treated the workers and the unions when mediating or arbitrating and and what your your view as a youngster on that <laughs> looking back is oh boy uh i'd have to say it, it's it's otherworldly uh i'll be honest uh my experiences uh very briefly as an nlrb agent uh i this was under an administration that was not friendly to labor organizing uh to labor unions uh and i went there bright eyed bushy tailed thinking i was going to transform the world uh maybe like the labor board boys 60 some years before me that didn't happen uh and I think this brings up this, uh, you know, the machinery that Ron writes about doesn't exist anymore today, but uh, the government agency today, the NLRB, uh, everyone here knows that is a political football. Uh, and the board today is is a is doing great work on behalf of, of workers and union organizing. Uh, but just recently, I don't know if folks have seen this, and, and I think this brings up Again, uh, the role of the state, uh, the board is woefully underfunded to do its mission. Uh, I, I've lost count of how many Starbucks uh, have petitioned for recognition uh, for an election. Uh, the board can't do that work right now. Uh, so, Jack, I, uh, Suzanne, I don't know if that's a good answer to your question, but that's what comes. So it's, it's it's good insight, and certainly I would agree. Um, as a 31 year employee of the National Labor Relations Board, um, funding, underfunding, lack of funding, um, completely ruins the ability to be effective. And we saw that across many, many agencies under the last administration. So um, back to you, Dr. Schatz. One of my first thoughts in reading your book was how the War Labor Board members were overwhelmingly male, as you've alluded to so far, and I had sort of a knee-jerk reaction. Then, of course, had to think about the time in which that was all done. Um, but could you tell us anything about the handful of women who were yes. involved? Um, the the, the, uh, the, the... The National World Labor Board itself, the president, the, all, all 12 were male. But my book is about the staff underneath it, although some of whom were promoted to became public employee, public representatives on the board. Um, uh, of that 240 or so, uh, all but six were male. Um, the, only one was only one was 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 one of the of, of the board's staff the, in the national office was a woman. I was very fortunate to find her and inter, interview her. This is in two thousand and eight. I, I I found her found her. Uh, I I I got her name. I found what college she went to. I contacted her college. They won't give me her name, but but I, they contacted her and said, told them about me, and she was with. So I went to her to her, her, her retirement home in in uh, in New Hampshire, and she tells a great story. She's a she's a uh, uh, a, a uh, her father is a professor. Her her mother is a psychologist. Um, she goes to Bennington College. She so you see so, so upper middle class professional occupation, and uh, but she says all the she, all the students in, in, at Bennington. She said they're all think they're all think they're all communists. They're all radicals, <laughs> but they don't know anything about workers. So she goes to work at a factory, and she volunteers and works in a factory and finds that the, the workers in the factories don't think anything like what the her fellow students at Bennington did. And much of it was divided uh, ethnically and religiously amongst them, the, the French and, 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 and uh, others divide, ethnically divided amongst them. Um, and then she got hired as, as a mediator in New York. 
Now she did this for about a year and a half or two. And it was a sort of a interesting period in her life. Her husband was also one of these mediators for the board. And then he was drafted and she followed him. And then after the war, they went to other things altogether. That was her story. Uh, the four other uh, women did it just as, as not uncommon, did this temporarily during the war and never after. There was one who's this exception, Jean McKelvey. Jean McKelvey, who became a professor of, of industrial relations at, 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 uh, 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 at Sarah Lawrence during the, during the war, before, during the 30s, but then got hired in the, uh, the War Labor Board's branch in upstate New York. And she, so she uh, became quite expert at industrial relations. Um, and, and, and then when Cornell University created this School of Industrial and Labor Relations, she was one of the first three faculty hired. And she worked there for 35, 40 years. Um, she would, uh, she, She's different because her husband was a historian too. Her, her husband was a historian, but they never had any children. So she devoted all her time you know, to her, her professional life. Um, and she, she, uh, in her, her papers are well worth looking at there at Cornell. Um, and, and my interview with her is, is in, in the transcripts are there at Cornell. Uh, for instance, she did a course uh, which she called Bus 101 where she would take the, stu the, stu the students from the industrial relations program and take them to one factory after another and just have them meet with the workers and talk to them, meet with the trade unionists and, and interview them um, the, the, uh, all around in upstate New York. Um, many of those professors of industrial relations became, you know, academics, you know, scholarly. She was more, uh, down to earth work with the actual people, not being not writing scholarly work. You know, she did a little bit of scholarly work, but not not mostly. Uh, she was also different in that she then made an effort, and there were few, very few amongst them, but she was an exception who wanted to were willing to uh, to to try to break the ra the race barrier in that field. And, and she, uh, William Gould, the fourth, who was the, uh, became the, the uh, chairman of the National Labor Relations Board um, in, in, in the 19, uh, in the Clinton administration was one of her students. Mm. You know, uh, 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 this, the, the great grandson of, of a slave. Um, it also, she made a special effort to try to work, to, to, to bring women into the, into the field. So she was an exception to them, but mostly this, now that's changed now. You know, I mean, there's the, the still mediation, mediators and arbitrators, you know, but, but, but the, the, field is, the field has changed a lot since then. But back in the period that I was writing about, it was overwhelmingly male and to pretend otherwise would be this would be an illusion. Okay, thank you. Mr. Metzger, you authored a summary review of Dr. Schatz's book in which you liken his focus on the War Labor Board to focusing on referees in a football game. Um, and except that those disputes uh, were games and the disputes that the War Labor Board crew and its aftermath focused on were anything but games to be sure. Um, so their outcomes, though, still affect our present problems and our future possibilities. Can you speak to the neutrality or lack thereof of the War Labor Board staff and how class distinctions uh, informed their actions? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm really just going by Ron's book. Um, and as I said before, I was really amazed. Uh, John said, looking back at uh, those are the War Labor Board and immediate post war period, I think you said it was otherworldly to you in terms of what you've experienced. Um, and I had somewhat the same uh, reaction. Uh, I was 
they did not seem neutral to me. Um, and Ron and I have have talked about this. Uh, that, that Sylvester Garrett decision there uh, that I talked about uh, on two B. There's all kinds of ways that he could have fudged that, um, and just made it ambiguous or left it up in the air, or you know, so that one guy gets to keep his job and the other guy loses his job. But it's a very solidly pro labor, uh, and he must have realized. This reverses the whole history of factory labor uh, since Frederick Wislow Taylor. Um, just throws it out the throws it out the window. Um, now you could argue, and I'm not, not might, that he was a like a Scalia, a textualist, because if you read the text carefully, um, he made the right decision. Yeah. Um, so there's ambiguity there, but I I, I think that I would. My sense from Ron's book is that the labor professionals were highly pro-labor. And as Ron said, this is when the labor movement was strong. And if they were going to be valuable to management, they would need to recognize uh, that strength and, de- and help management deal with it in an effective way. Um, but then it's also the development of a, of a, a class as part of the professional middle class development in the post-war period um, when the professional jobs, including management, but all kinds of education jobs and things like that, uh, increased fivefold from 1940 to 1980, which is basically the period cover Ron covers. The, the workforce as a whole doubled during that time, but professional jobs went from, uh, I think, 11% to 26%, and they're close to 40% now. Uh, so there's this enormous uh, in, increase in professional jobs and they're getting much better compensation. So the trajectory, the arc of the profession to go from um, George Taylor to George Schultz, I don't know their incomes, but I'll bet they're, they're real different. Um, that by the end of the period, that by, by 1980, this is a middle class, a professional middle class occupation that sort of has its own view of things, which it always did, as Ron shows, but, um, but has its own class uh, way of looking at things that is about being in the middle between yeah. capital and labor. Yeah, they're trying, they're trying to. Uh, uh, I was struck by a, a speech, uh, an article that John R. Commons wrote in 1906 about there are three classes. There's the, the laboring class, there's the employer class, you know, not talking at all about agriculture, and, 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 the, and the public in between, and it's the public who will determine. Um, uh, and, and these people, for the most part, there's some exceptions amongst these labor boys. For instance, uh, uh, David Cole, who was an important f- figure amongst, amongst them, was the son of, of, uh, of, of, of a, m- 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 an employ- a manufacturer uh, and was rather somewhat more conservative than the others. But most of them come from middle class backgrounds of that time, of the 1900s, 1910s, 20s. Uh, they were. Um, uh, Often, children of of, uh, of the uh, progressive era, more than a few were sons or daughters of pastors mm-hmm. or ministers uh, or or religiously devout, and that the, uh, influenced their kind of thinking. Um, uh, even at later years, we're speaking now. John was speaking about the Sylvester Garrett. Talk about his wife. At least you know his wife. His wife was Mary M- Molly Yard. M- M- Molly Yard was the head of the, of the so- young socialists of America in the 1930s. Um, not, not, not the Trotskyists of those, the, the, the independents. Yeah. Independent, um, uh, and, and, and then they, they become married. She's the daughter of, of uh, 
Chinese missionaries. She grows up in China. Um, she later becomes president of the National Organization for Women. These are these are re social reformers. You know, uh, the, the, uh, um, I would not call them revolutionaries. You know, the revolutionary was in the term, the title for, the, for our, today's session, but they were reformers. They were trying to make the world better. Slowly, over stages, step by step by step, and believed it was possible to do that. And were they successful? Well, that's questionable. But who knew, you know, none of us are, 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 are totally green. We know that we don't achieve everything we want in life. They were trying hard for many, many years and made some marks for their own credit. Um, you know, they were idealists. John, do you have anything you'd like to say in response to what, what Jack and Ron just said? For uh, in, in practical terms, I just, uh, and I'll be brief because I, I think Joseph White wants to say something. There, there's an early chapter where uh, Ron writes about how George Taylor's problem solving ability, where he would uh, have this venting out process where people would just get to, to air out their, their grievances, for lack of a better term, and he would write down areas of agreement. And if you go to the, the end of this era, the late 1970s, there's a, there's a classic book of negotiation that's still in print today called Getting to Yes by uh, I think it's William Urry and Roger Fisher. And that is one of the techniques where you start from your areas of agreement and then well, you deal with those tricky things uh, eventually. So it, I think this, this practical problem solving techniques are, are with us in many areas of life, not just industrial relations, but uh, you know, FMCS mediators are, are, are doing like marriage and dispute resolution. Uh, so, that's what yeah. comes to mind. If, 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 I'm, if I might, uh, it's just a couple words here. Uh, part of this is, you know, their field cont continues. It's just in new fields. You know, mo most of us, if we're mar married and it works out badly, you seldom do go to divorce lawyers. They're too expensive. You go to mediators and, 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 and they mediate solutions or, or, uh, 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 one thing, um, they, uh, the, the union and the contracts in the older industries, the blue car industries were slowly declining. Uh, uh, but that wasn't because they broke, they broke all these contracts. What they're doing is moving new facilities in, to the non-union sectors of, uh, in, this, in the South, and, and of course, many later outside the United States. Um, but then there's new fields, particularly because of, of John F. Kennedy's uh, this decision to, to recognize uh, public employees in the federal government, and then in New York State and Illinois and other states where Pennsylvania, where unions were where, where unions were strong, public employees have unions. And these same old labor board boys are appointed, especially in New York State, and they create a model, which is followed in other states, but it's also in, in Wisconsin and others, where this whole system is evolved, used there. So, the, and, and I remember interviewing John Dunlop about this. And I said, but I think, you know, you say your system's never been ruined, but hasn't it been ruined? I mean, it does no longer exist. Oh, he said, well, sure, I'll grant you that, but who makes cigars anymore? <laughs> I mean, you know, union, the, the, the cigar makers union is down, but it's something else is created. That was his response to this. Um, so the new kinds of unions co come in and these people are there uh, in that field. Okay, thank you. Um, I did. Joe White have a question. Uh, Joe, yeah. go ahead. Yes, I do, uh, uh, Suzanne. Uh, 
Okay, I'm, I'm happy. Uh, I'm happy and not particularly surprised that the discussion has uh, has uh, developed uh, in a way that has led to the uh, question of just who were uh, where were these guys coming from, and do we have a uh, and uh, and do we have a language uh, uh, that uh, captures and accurately expresses uh, their values, their uh, views of the present, the future. Of the, of the future and the, and the so on. Okay, uh, okay. Well, communists and socialists won't work. That uh, they weren't. Uh, okay, yeah, these guys weren't of uh, 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 that. Uh, liberal, uh, liberal. Well, yeah. Who, who wasn't a liberal back uh, then? Uh, okay, uh, Mitt Romney's father, the head of uh, American Voters, was a liberal. Liberal Republican, to be sure, but uh, but liberal progressive. Well, that gets a little bit uh, clo uh, 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 closer, uh, okay, uh, a little bit closer, but uh, still progressivism could mean a lot of things to a lot of people, if not all things to all men. Uh, okay, so uh, so I was about to throw in the uh, towel on this and say, well, uh, Ron's guy, uh, uh, well, the, uh, the labor board crew were pro-labor and, and leave it at of that okay, but then it suddenly occurred to me that uh, 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 that there was a, a movement. That's what I'm going to call it. Uh, a movement in the first half of the uh, 20th century uh, uh, called industrial democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, industrial democracy. Now, to my knowledge, that term, the term industrial democracy, virtually is non-existent these days. Is uh, is, is not existent uh, these days. And uh, to my way of uh, thinking, the fact that it's uh, non existent these days tells you an awful lot about the times in which we are living, uh, uh, living right now. Okay, well, well, now I have to get to a, uh, 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 get to a question. So my question to Ron and everybody else can uh, join in here uh, is, uh, Ron, did, uh, did your crew from, was your crew familiar, familiar with, and did they ever use the concept of uh, industrial, the, the uh, idea of uh, the industrial democracy? And if they did, uh, how, uh, what kind of, uh, what did they make uh, out of it? What kind of, uh, you know, what kind of bells and whistles and frosting on the cake and uh, uh, qualifications and so on did they uh, uh, do? Or was it absence from their vocabulary as well? I think it, I think it, 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 it withered by the 1940s, you know, even even the early third, late 30s, when by, by when they were coming to, to maturity, you know, uh, industrial uh, democracy was really a fiery kind of movement in the 1910s and early 20s, but very soon withered. That's, that's my, as best as I can determine. And hence, they were more into the idea that you could cooperate between. Um, but what other people may know, have a different opinion or know better than I do. Okay, thank you, Joe. Uh, I might also ask, some of Joe's point and John's point, most of the people here in this little, small group here, many, many of you anyhow, you go on to college and some became professors and so forth. What did these guys do when, in, when they were appointed as presidents and provosts and deans? What did they do there? They took the same models from industry and adopted it in the universities. So they became student representatives on faculty boards, student representatives on trustees, faculty representatives on trustees. And I didn't mean they get, that we had democracy. The power remained with, with, with the real, but there was more, there was an attempt to try to, to you know, to, uh, 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 Clark Kerr was the president of, of, uh, uh, of the University of California at Berkeley. He was, Failed utterly with the with these uh, uh, at the free speech movement at Berkeley, um, and ultimately was fired by the new governor Ronald Reagan. 
but others, most importantly, Robin Fleming at the University of Michigan did, was able to, over, to, 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 to make, establish some sort of peace at, at, at Ann Arbor, even though Ann Arbor was the, the, the home of, of SDS. So they, they, they succeeded in bringing a one of, the, one of these speakers, what? one of these speakers was. You're, you're okay. <laughs> um, did you want to finish what you were saying? Someone was just unmuted, that's all. That's all, I, I have, I have. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, just to Ron's point in, uh, I learned about Clark Kerr at a different point in his life. Uh, it was actually during a seminar in a new left and uh, in, uh, in, the, in the wonderful documentary, I think it's called Berkeley in the sixties, uh, Clark Kerr takes a much different role. And there's that famous speech of Mario Savio on the steps of Sprouls Hall, where he, he denounces Clark Kerr. Like, could you imagine a, uh, it, it, it's it's a beautiful speech. You got to yes. Google, uh, you see it on YouTube. But uh, he says, "Can you imagine a chairman speaking against his board?" And you know, Savio describes this machine really that Kerr helped create. And Savio says, "We want no part of that." But I, I had Mario Savio's uh, son in, in my labor history class, um, uh, and so I was able to interview uh, uh, Mario a couple of weeks before he died. Um, uh, sadly, died. You know, you know, a young, rather a young man. Uh, the uh, Mario Savio wanted a college like Kerr went to at, when he was twenty years old. That is Swarthmore, a small college where there's close interaction, and 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 in his one of his important speeches is before. Uh, the free speech movement in 1963, in the uses of the of the of the multi university, Kerr says, "Who's losing in these big universities? It's the undergraduates." He recognizes what's going on, uh, but he uh, doesn't uh, have the vision to get beyond it. Oh, uh, yes, please, Jack. It, you know, just on that industrial democracy thing, I think it's interesting. Uh, I, I don't know that earlier, um, early 20th century part of industrial democracy, which was militant, but in the late 40s, um, uh, Phil Murray, Clint Golden, and, uh, and the, uh, the, I can't remember the other guy's name. He was a Pittsburgher. Couldn't Golden? And and Howard uh, Harold um, Harold uh, he was a, from the, he was a steel mm -hmm. and then yeah. yeah so you know what I mean there, there was a period there in the late forties when they used the term industrial democracy and it meant the kind of tripartite arrangement where there would be a public spokesman with uh, management and labor. Um, <laughs> there are now um, progressives, progressive Elizabeth Warren about sectoral bargaining, about having uh, workers on the board of directors and that sort of thing, including Thomas Piketty, who gets, you know, is an economist who people actually read, um, is, it has that whole workplace democracy thing, which is at a higher level mm -hmm. and does not necessarily include contract unions the way we understand them. Um, but there is, um, and, and there was a workplace democracy discussion in the early 70s. Um, yes. Again, and Dunlop was part, was part of this, uh, where they were, uh, and again in the 90s, Dunlop, in, according to your book, where this tripartite arrangement was, uh, was again proposed. But labor has to have enough power to disrupt to, uh, to, to, to disrupt economic power quite, in order quite to so have a tripartite arrangement. You can't just will it. Uh, You're absolutely right. And what happened was the, 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 that the 
corporations became much more militant and fighting against unions in the mid 70s. It begins even a little earlier, begins in the oh, 70s. And, and, we would and, argue and, about that. I don't think it's until the 90s. I, I think the, the, the labor movement was very weak in the 80s and could have been damaged much more, much more if management had been more militant, in my view. Yeah. Okay, well, there is so much more to discuss and no time in which to do it left. So I'm really, I'm sorry for that because it's been incredibly interesting. I urge anyone who hasn't had a chance yet to buy and read this book. It is really interesting um, and covers many decades and many industries and it will be worth your time. I, it's also, I thought um, Dr. Schatz, the approach of a collective biography in and of itself from a writer's perspective is super interesting. The fact that you did so many interviews, personal interviews with the movers and shakers is something yet again um, that makes this book special. So uh, we're really glad to have had this conversation about it. I'm gonna turn it back over to John Hare who will do a little wrap up for us. For those of you who've been watching, you might want to save the chat. And the way you do that is if you're looking at the bottom, very bottom spot of the chat, you'll see three dots on the right. If you click on those, you can choose save chat. And I suggest that to you because Nathan Ruggles, our Battle of Homestead volunteer has been um, feeding the chat with many important links, interesting links to things that have been referenced in the discussion. And uh, they'll be of, of use to you later. So save the chat. And John, it's all yours. Uh, with one last thing, which is I am so sorry about my power outage. <laughs> <laughs> Not your fault. And then trying to get my computer back online after a power outage. But uh, my I blame the bosses for that. Yeah, but, well, no doubt they heard this was going on and, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Suzanne. And, and certainly uh, to, to our three panelists, thank you so much. You've really, thank you. uh, you, you, you've really raised uh, issues. I think that um, it's important for us to talk about. Um, uh, the first point that's just so true that we that we need to start with is uh, there can be no mediation or arbitration if there are no unions at, at the workplace. Uh, there could be, but it becomes an individual matter almost always, and um, it's a big road to hoe. Um, so unions have to have to grow. Uh, unions have to be representative in the places in the workplaces where workers are. For there to be any possibility for the employer to be forced to at least give some rationality to the positions that they take. Um, so union organizing has to be job number one, but mostly um, I think the, the idea also occurred to me and, um, that the Battle of Homestead could have ended differently you know, and, and people take it as, as fate that it happened or as inevitable survival of the fittest or whatever. But every moment of our lives, things could be different. Yep. <laughs> and uh, that's the, the attitude we have to take um, as we try to make the world a better place and our lives better. So um, thanks again to our audience who I know it's not easy to uh, only be observers and not participants. And um, unfortunately, it's difficult to do in this context, um, but uh, I know that you bear with us because you've been with us uh, through our programs. And I hope uh, you will find uh, our next series, our next program series, a, another fascinating discussion. Um, it's gonna be on May 19th. You'll, you'll have email uh, notices about it. Uh, it's called Death of a Jewish Radical in Erie, 1922, Echoes from a Century Ago, 
we're looking at the at the 1920s, a a turbulent time uh, in our society. Uh, the the miners are kicking up and and organizing and being uh, killed and 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 thrown in jail. Um, there are big anti-immigration and anti-black activities going on, not just in the South, but in small town Pennsylvania and other places. Uh, and uh, some of the our members uh, who who have study the issue of, of uh, this Jewish radical in Erie, uh, have a program to present to us. Uh, Kip Dawson, a former miner, and Lou Martin, a, a professor and, and a member of the board of the West Virginia um, Mine Wars Museum, they're going to present their research on crime investigation and the community aftermath and how many of the dangerous political currents in the divided America of the uh, person who was killed named Herman Martius uh, have resurged uh, on, on in our own times. So um, check, out, uh, check out the publicity and um, sign up for the, this. And I think you'll find it a, a very interesting, very interesting program about an actual event uh, who, and Herman Martius happened to have been uh, a relative of Kip's, and perhaps her grandfather, if I if I remember correctly. So um, that's coming up, and we have other other really interesting programs. I'm not going to go through them all because you're gonna you're gonna hear from us about them later with with all the details. But something to remember: July 6th, the anniversary of the Battle of Homestead. That's the date that the barges came. Uh, down the river and the townspeople and workers uh, prevented them from landing uh, right where the pump house is today. Um, and July 6th, we're gonna have an in-person event uh, at the pump house. And um, it'll probably be most of the morning. We're gonna have one of our Wednesday morning breakfasts, but this time it's gonna be a memorial, memorial uh, with uh, dedication to discussion of the events of the Battle of Homestead and analysis and where we are today. So those are two things. Um, again, uh, to all the participants tonight, thank you so much. And um, uh, we'll look forward to your help. Uh, check out our website if you haven't. Uh, and if you have, uh, it's battleofhomestead.org. If you haven't uh, joined as a member, consider doing that. I know we've had a few problems with people attempting to, to utilize the on, online payment systems. Uh, but if you stick with us, we'll somehow find a way that you can pay your dues. And I <laughs> promise you that. So uh, thank you very much, appreciate it. And thank you Tess for being our chief engineer. Uh, thank you, Suzanne, for being our moderator. Thank you, Nathan, for being the curator of our questions and, and all the others. Uh, we'll see you again. And Ron, again, welcome to Pittsburgh. Welcome back to Pittsburgh. Thank, thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And I'm looking forward to reading all the, the questions. And, and, and I'd like to meet you outside of this uh, setting, too. Yeah, so let me just say one thing, John, um, for our panelists, but as well for anybody who's joined us for tonight's program, we do have a bi-weekly gathering, and uh, John referred to it as a breakfast because we usually, pre-COVID, did it at the Eaton Park on the waterfront in Pittsburgh. We've since been doing it by Zoom and you are welcome to join us. It's just a wonderful time of camaraderie and information sharing and activist information. Um, and we'll get a, you, you have a link that Nathan just put in in the chat. Um, if you send us an email, we'll put you on the breakfast list. Thank you again to our panelists and to everyone else who participated. Have a good night.